Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. Today we find ourselves in the year 2007, looking at what has been called one of the worst films ever made. Though that tends to be said about pretty much every polarizing film nowadays, which tells me a lot of you have not seen many movies. Anyway, today we're looking at I Know Who Killed Me. Directed by Chris Syvertson, this ill-fated flick stars Lindsay Lohan as the titular character who knows who killed her. Except, spoiler alert, she doesn't actually die in the movie. Already I see a problem here. Lohan had previously starred in mostly family-friendly films, including modern remakes of The Parent Trap and Freaky Friday, and the critically acclaimed Mean Girls. I Know Who Killed Me was one of her early forays into more grown-up cinema. The production was rocky, to say the least. Filming stopped almost as soon as it started due to Lohan being, according to her representative, overheated and dehydrated. Lohan was going through some issues at the time, and I suppose dehydration could have been a side effect, so her rep wasn't necessarily lying. Lying by omission, maybe. Shortly afterward, Lohan suffered from appendicitis, which took longer than usual to recover from due to the incision becoming infected, poor girl. And around the same time, she acknowledged she was going through some issues and voluntarily checked into rehab, though she was still able to film during the day while returning to the rehab facility at night. All things considered, the studio was incredibly patient with her, which is a little surprising considering how many stories you hear about actresses being difficult to work with. Hello? Speaking? Uh-huh. Difficult to work with doesn't actually mean difficult to work with. It really means refused a studio executive's advances. Oh, well, thanks for clearing that up. What was that? No, I don't want to talk to you about my car's warranty. Considering the movie had a major star attached and a relatively low $12 million budget, you'd think it would be guaranteed to turn a profit. You'd be wrong. The movie had a dismal box office performance, opening at number 9 and making less than $10 million during its run. It was widely panned by critics and the movie-going public alike, but it did get a few positive reviews, and in recent years it has undergone a critical re-evaluation and developed a cult following. There are some people who enjoy it more for its infamy than its quality, of course, but some genuinely consider it a good movie that was misunderstood at the time of its release. And such re-evaluations have happened to quite a few films over the years. Blade Runner, The Thing, even Showgirls. But does today's film deserve the same treatment, or did the critics get it right the first time? Let's find out. Lohan stars as junior college student Aubrey Fleming, who lives with her apparently wealthy family in a town called New Salem and has aspirations of becoming a writer. She's also a talented pianist, but decides to quit playing so she can focus on her writing. This makes her piano teacher very disappointed, and he leaves in a huff. Remember this, it will be important later. And please note, will be important does not necessarily mean will make sense. She also spends her free time flirting with the landscaper before flipping him off. Okay... That was weird. New Salem is a bit on edge as one of Aubrey's fellow students was recently found dead and partially dismembered, and they fear they may have a serial killer on their hands. The FBI investigators conclude the killer started with the digits before cutting off larger chunks of her arm and leg, though how they could possibly know that is beyond me. It's possible they did film a scene that explains this, and it ended up on the cutting room floor. In a recent interview, Syvertson revealed the existence of a three-and-a-half-hour director's cut of the film, and specifically mentioned a few scenes involving the FBI investigation that don't think I don't see you down there. That's right, go back down. Go back down. And you stay down there and think about what you've done. We're not doing that shit again. Anyway, after a football game, Aubrey ends up separated from her friends and spots the landscaper she flipped off earlier. He turns out to be a red herring, but she does get kidnapped by the real serial killer from a crowded main street in a college town right after a football game. With no witnesses. Yeah, that tracks. And the killer proceeds to start torturing the poor girl by freezing her extremities with dry ice and cutting them off. With a tool that appears to be made out of glass. Sir, have you heard of these things called knives? You can get them at Target, they're not expensive. 
A search begins for Aubrey and the FBI set up shop in a local church. I guess every other available space had already been claimed by the spirit store. Well, I hope our little investigation doesn't interfere with bingo night. What an odd thing to say. Fortunately, Bingo Night is saved when a passing motorist happens to find an unconscious and partially dismembered Aubrey on the side of the road. And what's left of her wakes up in the hospital, naturally a bit traumatized. What hospital am I in? Um, I'll get the doctor. You need the doctor to tell her what hospital she's in? Do you not know what hospital you're in? Are you even an actual nurse? Have you been vaccinated? and the crack team of FBI investigators attempt to figure out how Aubrey managed to be the only victim of the serial killer to date who survived. Which is a bit confusing as I was under the impression the student that was killed earlier was his first victim. But now they're implying there are several others. In the span of a week. Seems unlikely. Speaking of things that are unlikely... I think she escaped. You think she escaped? On one leg. I'm not sure that I agree with you 100% on your police work there, Lil. Anyway, Aubrey's parents are happy to welcome most of their daughter home, but there's a problem. Aubrey claims to be a young woman named Dakota who has a completely different and far more abrasive personality and no memory of Aubrey's parents or boyfriend or any part of her life. She insists she grew up in the bad part of town with a crack-addicted mother who OD'd when she was very young, and she's been on her own ever since, working as an exotic dancer to pay the bills. The doctors conclude the trauma Aubrey went through somehow brought forth this alternate personality, which is backed up by the fact that Aubrey has been writing fictional stories about a woman named Dakota. But despite her parents' attempts to jog her memory and a DNA test seemingly confirming Aubrey's identity, she continues to insist she is Dakota. And this is the premise for the movie. A young woman goes through a traumatic event and wakes up thinking she's someone else. Is it some sort of multiple personality disorder? Or is something else going on? We'll get to that, but first, let's look at how this movie goes off the rails. First of all, Lohan has a non-nudity clause in her contract. Nothing wrong with that. If she's not comfortable being nude on camera, then she shouldn't be. Good for her for enforcing her boundaries. The problem is, she was cast as a stripper. And the other strippers in this movie clearly had no problem getting naked on camera, which makes Dakota's fully clothed pole dancing unintentionally hilarious. To be clear, I don't blame Lohan for this. I blame the filmmakers. Second, thanks to Aubrey's parents being loaded, Dakota is gifted a prosthetic hand. And it's basically the Luke Skywalker hand, which I'm pretty sure was not a real thing in 2007. I'm not even sure if it's a real thing today. Did this just become a science fiction movie? And she gets a robotic leg to go with it, but the doctor warns her to keep it charged or it'll become dead weight. Gee, I wonder if that will be important later. Third, the sex scene. After Aubrey's parents bring her home, Dakota meets Aubrey's boyfriend and decides to bonk him right then and there because why not? And the mother does nothing to stop this. This is the only part of the movie that is intentionally hilarious as Mrs. Fleming tries in vain to distract herself from the noise by frantically cleaning her kitchen. I actually got some genuine laughs out of this, though there is some unintentional hilarity as well when Lohan's bra magically disappears and reappears between shots. Fourth, who oh boy. Before we get to point number four in this movie's journey off the rails, though in hindsight, I'm not sure it was ever on the rails to begin with, I need to tell you about the twist. Dakota is actually who she says she is. She and Aubrey are twins separated at birth. And the circumstances by which they were separated are... interesting. The Flemings are not Aubrey's biological parents. Dakota's parents are. Mrs. Fleming happened to give birth around the same time, but the baby did not survive. So unbeknownst to his wife, Mr. Fleming went to the crackhead down the hall who just gave birth to twins and basically bought one to replace his own dead daughter and he somehow managed to keep this a secret from everyone for 20 years or so. Aubrey figures this out despite having only some flimsy circumstantial evidence that doesn't actually prove anything. But who knows, maybe there's actual proof in the three and a half hour director's cut. I will not warn you again. And if that wasn't ridiculous enough for you, just wait, there's more. 
The twins have some sort of psychic link that causes them to sustain each other's injuries. So Dakota was never actually kidnapped and dismembered like Aubrey and the other victims. When the killer did something to Aubrey, it magically happened to Dakota. This includes her finger spontaneously getting frostbite and falling off. She doesn't go to the hospital because, in her own words, hospitals are for rich people. Sadly, that's one of the few realistic aspects of the movie. Instead, we get an unintentionally hilarious scene where she tries to sew her own dead finger back on. I'm no doctor, but I don't think that's gonna work. And indeed, this entire premise doesn't work because it's inconsistent. We see Aubrey's entire hand encased in dry ice and frostbitten, but somehow this only affects one finger on Dakota's hand. So they're partially stigmatic twins? I guess? And believe it or not, I'm not done. There is one more thing that puts this movie in the realm of batshit insanity. Syvertson's use of color. One color specifically. There is so much blue in this movie, to the point where I start to wonder if Syvertson has some sort of unhealthy obsession with the color. Clothes, walls, roses, plates, trophies, gloves, signs, lighting, even the killer's instruments are made of blue glass. Blue, 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 da ba dee da ba die. it's all blue! Why is everything blue? Well. Allegedly. The colors are supposed to represent the twins. Blue for Aubrey, red for Dakota. And indeed, we do see hints of this in their clothing choices, with Dakota preferring red while Aubrey opts for blue. In fact, damn near everything of Aubrey's is blue. Aubrey chose the colors? Color, you mean. The problem is, much like the twin stigmata, it's not consistent. We often see blue in Dakota's scenes, and there's even uses of blue and red in scenes that have nothing to do with either twin, like the Juco football game where we see flashes of blue and red during the tackles. There's also a shot of a tackle that's reversed for no goddamn reason. Seriously, Syvertson, what the fuck are you doing? This has been a point of contention among critics and fans of the film. Some find I Know Who Killed Me's use of color to be ridiculous to the point of comedy, while others think Syverson's use of color was simply misunderstood, with at least one critic comparing it to Daria Argento's Suspiria. Now, that critic, and indeed all critics, are entitled to their opinion. My opinion is anyone comparing I Know Who Killed Me to Suspiria needs to go back and get a shitload of dimes. It's true that Suspiria, like I Know Who Killed Me, uses very vibrant colors. Unlike I Know Who Killed Me, Suspiria's use of color has a coherent purpose. Argento deliberately used vivid colors to give the film an unrealistic, nightmarish quality. Syvertson's color choices were done because... Oh, fuck if I know. Maybe there was a symbolic reason initially, but at some point he clearly lost the plot. Oh, speaking of the plot, we still have a murder mystery to solve. Dakota visits the grave of the girl who was killed early in the film and finds a blue ribbon with a note from the piano teacher. Remember him? Well, they deduce from this blue ribbon, and literally nothing else, that the piano teacher is the serial killer. I know who killed me. Hey, that's the name of the movie! Yeah, the piano teacher who showed up for about a minute in the beginning of the movie was the killer the whole time. Now you might be wondering, why did he kill those girls? Was it because they quit playing piano and he decided, well, I guess they have to die now? And why does he have a bunch of prosthetic limbs hanging in his basement? Knowing the answers to those questions would entail the filmmakers actually put some thought into the murder mystery, which they did not. Anyway, they go to his house, Mr. Fleming gets killed off screen, Mr. Piano Teacher gets killed on screen, Dakota's leg runs out of juice, but not until after the killer is dead, so it means nothing. She digs up the buried alive body of Aubrey before she suffocates and they live something ever after. And that's I Know Who Killed Me. And boy was that a wild ride. I can see why the Razzie voters chose this one. It's imaginative, I'll give it that, but between the insane story and the hilarious color choices, it's also completely nuts. I can kinda see what they were going for, but they took a wrong turn somewhere. Several wrong turns, really. That said, I do actually recommend checking this one out because it has to be seen to be believed. I don't know if you'll enjoy it, I can't really say I enjoyed it, but I am glad I had the experience of seeing it, and I can honestly say I've never seen anything like it. And I hope I never do again. 
The movie had eight Razzie nominations and took home seven awards. Worst Screenplay, Worst Director, Worst Excuse for a Horror Movie, a one-time category, Worst Remake or Ripoff, as the Razzies claimed it ripped off Hostel, Saw, and The Patty Duke Show. Is there a Razzie for lamest joke at an award show? Worst Actress, a tie between Lindsay Lohan and Lindsay Lohan. Ha ha. Worst Screen Couple for Lindsay Lohan and Lindsay Lohan. That is literally the same joke. And of course, Worst Picture. God, just reading off those awards was more of a chore than watching I Know Who Killed Me. What the hell, Razzies? And boy, do I not agree with Worst Actress. And I suspect the overall quality of the movie and Lindsay's personal troubles at the time influenced that decision. Because her performance was honestly fine. She wasn't gonna win an Oscar or anything, but her acting was at least competent. So I'm calling bullshit on that one. But the real question is, did it deserve to win Worst Picture? Honestly? Ooh, that's a tough one. Ah, there were some real stinkers in 2007 as evidenced by I Know Who Killed Me's fellow Worst Picture nominees. Daddy Day Camp, a sequel no one was asking for, including apparently the star of the original movie as Eddie Murphy chose not to reprise his role. I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, a horribly unfunny comedy with terrible performances and an SNL alum doing a racist Asian caricature. Norbit, somehow ditto the hell was going on in 2007? And the final nominee was Bratz, loosely based on the toy line of the same name. This one was baffling. Four longtime friends start high school and initially promise to remain friends, but that promise falls apart pretty quickly as due to the influence of the popular kids who basically run the school, they split off into their own cliques and turn into bitter enemies. But eventually they come to realize how stupid this is and they can still remain friends while also doing their own thing. And they're back together and all is right with the world. It's a very basic story, one that I'm sure has been told a dozen times before at least. It's similar to Mean Girls in fact but it's perfectly serviceable for a simple teen comedy. The problem is everything I just described happens in the first half hour. And then it just keeps going. And they start arguing again, and they get back together again, and somehow there's a musical competition, and the whole time I'm thinking, why is this not over? You had your story, you had your beginning, middle, and end. Why are you still going? How is two-thirds of this movie padding? So yeah, 2007 was a banner year for shit, and that's not even getting into movies that escape the worst picture category, like Good Luck Chuck. Remember when we thought Dane Cook was funny? Why did we think that? So what's the actual worst picture of the year? Honestly, I think you can make a case for any of the aforementioned movies because they're all pretty terrible, though they're terrible in different ways. Except for Norbit and Chuck and Larry, which are somehow terrible in the same ways, and that still boggles my mind. But personally, I think I would have to go with Bratz, and I'll tell you why. The other aforementioned movies are at least movies. Bratz barely qualifies as a movie. It feels more like a collection of stories for half-hour Disney Channel TV shows that were hastily stitched together. I Know Who Killed Me didn't have a good story, but at least it had a story that filled its entire runtime. Bratz did not. So I'm calling it my worst picture of 2007. That said, I can still appreciate the movie for inspiring a video where someone dubbed a scene using the Christian Bale Batman voice. I'm not snob, I'm just better than you are, yeah! Stop it! All of you, just stop it! I can't believe you said that to Chloe. That will never not be funny. Wish I could say the same for the movie we'll be talking about next time. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I miss my girls. Me too.